Hello my bookish friends, welcome or welcome back. I am Elizabeth, this is Reading Riley, and today we're gonna to be talking about all of the books that I read in May. I have 14 books to talk to you about. I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed, it's okay, everything's fine. Uh, we're gonna see how much of these books I can actually remember. If you're not new, you know how I do my wrap ups. I like to start with the lowest ranked book and then work my way up to the highest ranked books. I do rate in half stars, but I'm going to tell you just in like full stars the general gist of how it went. I have one two star book this month. I have eight books in the three star range, which is a little bit disappointing. I'm not going to lie. It's a couple in there that I was really anticipating that I was really excited about, but we'll get there. I have five books that are in the four star range and one five star book this month. One two star, one five star, everything else in the middle. I read five horror books. I read two thriller books. I actually read three romances, but not really. I mean, they're romances, but with a twist. Two sci-fi books. One is like a sci-fi thriller, one mystery, and one suspense book. Let's go ahead and get into the books. We'll start breaking them down. Okay, let's start out with the two star book that I read this month. This one was the buddy read for the Thrill Till the Weekend round three. The book was The Missing by Kirsten Modglin. Okay, listen, I picked up the arrangement by her this year, first experience with this author, and I hated it. And that book has so much hype that when I read that, I was so upset. But I was like, you know what, I'm gonna give this author another shot. Let's just go into this with an open mind, see what happens. This book, generally speaking, is about this woman. She's on vacation. Her husband's working a lot. He's kind of ignoring her. This guy approaches her. He says, hey, you look like you're chilling by yourself. We've got one spot open on this yacht. If you want, you know, my boss said I could just like get somebody to fill the spot. It'll be free. If you want to, you know, come on, drinks, you know, whatever you want. And she's like, you know what? Maybe my husband will notice if he finds that I'm not here, that I'm gone. So you know what? Okay, I'm going to get on this boat. She ends up, her and four other strangers, deserted on this island. And so for the whole book, they're trying to figure out how to get off. That's your general premise, um, which is fine. I will say the twist in this book was really good, got me, but, and it's a big but, there were so many plot holes here. The way it's set up, mm, I was not invested in any way whatsoever in these characters. And the way that this ended, ugh, no, God, please, no, no, like the biggest eye roll I could give you right now, because the way that this ended, I can't tell you. I want to tell you, but I can't tell you. It was just not okay. It was not okay. Both of these books did the same thing where they were all about the twist, which is what I want. I want the twist, but it has to make sense. You have to make it make sense. I don't want to be shocked for the sake of being shocked. I want to be shocked because I'm so invested in these characters, because the story is so good, because I'm so into it that I didn't expect it to take this turn. I was shocked at the expense of like literally everything else in this book and that's just not okay with me. It felt cheap. It felt like the forever 21 of thrillers to me and no offense to anyone who loves this. Like if you are looking for that, somebody said that Kirsten Modlin writes these books for women like herself who want to just come home after a long day of work, sit down, curl up with a book, read it in one sitting, and like be shocked. And that's fine. If that's what you're looking for, no judgment whatsoever. It's just not what I'm looking for in my books. And unfortunately, I don't think this author is going to be one that I will be reading more of in the future. I think that's enough said. All right, let's move on to my three star books for this month. I have four of them. Two of these, unfortunately, were very highly anticipated books of mine. I feel like the parent that's like, I'm not mad at you. I'm just disappointed. Okay, the first book in this three star range is What Might Have Been by Holly Black. No, by Holly Miller. What? This one is one that technically fits into my romance category with a twist. And by that, I mean, I did a reading vlog that was based on the movie Sliding Doors. It's a 90s movie starring Gwyneth Paltrow, where she does a arguably decent British accent. I don't know. But this trope in this movie is basically you are living your life. You make one choice 
and that takes you down a path. But if you made a different choice in that same instance, it would take you down a completely different path. We follow these people down both paths based on just the tiniest change and one little choice that they made in their lives or one little thing, little insignificantly seeming thing that took them in completely different directions. A lot of times this trope is used to explore the idea of fate. If you've read Midnight Library by Matt Haig, it's kind of that idea, kind of sci-fi in that sense, but really not because we're not following every path in the multiverse. So stay with me here. I read three of these books, so I'll be telling you about all of them. Um, this one in particular was the lowest rated of the three for me. In this one, we're following Lucy. She quits her job and she has to figure out how she's going to move forward in her life. She's always wanted to write a book. She's kind of obsessed with romance because her parents have this really romantic, neat, cute story and they've been together for so long. She's at a bar one night. She runs into this photographer named Caleb. They get to chatting. They get to connecting. At the same time, she sees this guy walk by and it's the guy that got away. It's Max, who's this guy from her past who left her without explanation after college. And she gets like a fortune cookie or some kind of fortune that says you are going to come in contact with your one true love. You're meant to be whatever tonight. Is she going to stay in a small town where she grew up and write her novel? where she may have more interactions with Caleb, the photographer, or is she going to move to the big city, London, and get this high paying, high demanding writing job where she may spend more time with Max. And then we follow both paths. Like I said, it was just fine. When I went into books with this trope, I wasn't anticipating to get romances, but that's just kind of how it worked out. I was a little bit afraid that what these books were going to try to say was that I'm fated for this person. It didn't do that. It didn't push that on you that you have to be with one specific person in order to be happy. And I was really glad that actually none of these books did that. But a lot of them had different things to say about fate, which I found interesting. There were a couple things in this book that I really liked. All in all, I thought it was fine. It was a three star book. My next three star read is The Haunting of Ashburn House by Darcy Coates. I read this for Gabby's book troop book club this month. It was just fine. Again, this was my first Darcy Coates her writing style does remind me of Jennifer McMahon. I've read three Jennifer McMahon books and I've given them all three or 3.5 stars. It's really just not my thing. In this story, we're following Adrian, who has inherited Ashburn House from her great Aunt Edith, who is recently deceased. She has no connection with Aunt Edith. She doesn't know her at all. Her mother just cut ties with them. Edith lives on the top of this hill in a small town and well, lived. And she was kind of known for being that creepy old lady that always stays to herself, that's kind of mean. She never let anyone on the property. She was very standoffish. And she had some like strange things. Every Friday night, she would light this candle in the top of the tower. And there are no mirrors in the house. There are like little reminders etched into wood and things around the house. So when Adrian gets there with her cat, she's kind of taking all of this in. She's trying to get to know the townspeople. She's really destitute too. Like she's spending her last dollar just to get here and so she is struggling like the struggle is real for Adrian. She's got no backup plan there's no plan b. As the story unfolds I will say like there were a few moments one time my husband walked in behind me and I didn't hear him and he I got a little freaked out so I will give it that it gave me a little bit of the, the heebie-jeebies but ultimately the ending I felt like was unsatisfying it relied on I don't know how to say it without spoiling the explanation of the twist relied on something else that was kind of a stretch to begin with. And so that kind of bothered me. Like it just didn't make sense. I don't love a ghost story, but if you make it make sense, then I'm here for it. I'm okay with that. I need the ghost story to fit. I need it to be there for a reason. I need it to have this origin story that is real, that comes from a place of trauma that would make sense as to why we have this haunting, why we have this ghost. And in a sense, it did that, but it also took it too far. Hold. So yeah, The Haunting of Ashburn House, like I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. I thought it was fine. It's just those books aren't really for me. But I think there is an audience for that. I think there are people who love this kind of story, this cozy horror, who will enjoy this. So keep that in mind as well. And I don't... Unrecommend it. I don't... Disrecommend it. You know who you are if you like that type of story. Next, sadly, a three star is Sundial by Katrina Ward. I read this one in a vlog where I just kind of had a thriller, a horror, 
and a suspense book that I read. I'll link all of my vlogs for the month down below as well if you're interested in those. Let me premise this by saying I loved The Last House on Needless Street so much. Like one of my favorite books, love the twists, one of my favorite twists, everything about it loved it. So I went into this with very high expectations. And unfortunately, I got let down a little bit. We're following Rob. She is a mother of two young girls. She has a, a despicable husband. Can't even remember his name. Don't want to remember it. It was something weird, like Irving or something. I think it was Irving. He's a piece of shit. He's awful piece of shit. I also read the first chapter of this book in my try a chapter vlog that I did this month and I fell in love with the first chapter. It left me feeling like I wanted to kick Irving's ass for Rob. I wanted to go on this journey with her of female empowerment, take back her girls away from this son of a bitch, you know, just be the badass that she truly is. And unfortunately, that was not the tone of this book. Like I thought it was going to be one of those good for her type of deals where she has been put through the ringer and she comes out on top and she decides to take back her power. But it was not that she starts seeing some things in her older daughter, Callie, that are not good. Callie's behaving in a way that is strange. She's collecting bones. There's definitely this like kind of witchy vibe. Is it paranormal? Is it not paranormal? Rob decides to take Callie back to her hometown in Sundial. Kind of set her straight. So that's the general premise of this. It's um, definitely desert vibes. Really like the atmosphere in this. They do have alternating chapters though of a book that Rob is writing called Arrowwood that is about these girls that kind of reflect, kind of resemble her own girls and this eerie thing surrounding everyone. I didn't like those chapters at all. On top of that, we also have chapters where we go into the past and we learn about Rob's childhood as she grew up in Sundial. Didn't like those either. I was interested in the current day situation. I was interested in Rob, how she was gonna take care of this situation that she was in with her daughter, with her husband. And I wanted to know what was going on with that, but we didn't focus on that. And so I was really disappointed to be constantly taken back to these past chapters that I didn't care about, that I wasn't invested in. And I feel like I was just trying to do too many things. You don't know who's reliable or unreliable. You don't know if it's paranormal or if it's not paranormal. You don't know what's happening between her and her husband. The tone of this book, although it is kind of creepy in general, I just felt like it was misleading. It was trying to do too many things at once. And I just didn't love it like I wanted to, unfortunately. The Last House on Needless Street did have this comedic, undertone like with the cat the talking cat and I think if this book so okay trigger warnings I don't think this is a spoiler but if you don't want to know anything skip forward 30 seconds there is some cruelty to animals in here involving dogs so there's some kind of like experimentation going on with dogs so I will say that now here's what I think would have made this better if we had gotten the perspective of one of the dogs like we did in Needless Street. I think that would have made this book. I needed a little comic relief in there. I needed something that was weird in a good way. I don't know. It wasn't my kind of weird. And you know, I like weird. It wasn't my kind of weird. Let's move on. The next book I rated three stars this month was Hide by Kirsten White. Ugh, I hate to say it. You know, I don't want to rate these books poorly. Not that three is a poor score, but especially when it's something that I'm like highly anticipating. I want to be blown out of the park, you know, and I still recommend both of these. But if it's a three star, I still recommend it. There's a person for these books. So in Hyde, we're following this girl, Mac. I don't remember how old she's supposed to be. I thought she was supposed to be like in her 20s, but she honestly read like a teenager. All of these characters read like teenagers for me. Maybe I'm just old. I don't know. She signs up for this. They think it's going to be like a reality show or something, but the gist is they have to go to this abandoned amusement park. They have to hide in there for a week. They get breaks in between, just like during the day, I think, and then at sunset, they get to go back to where everyone gathers. But if she can hide for a week and not get caught, she wins $50,000. And on top of that, in the premise, we get this like backstory bit of Mac where she says, I'm going to win this because the only reason I'm alive is because I'm good at hiding. Why? Why is that? Because her dad killed her entire family while she hid in a cupboard. She's also homeless. She is on the streets. She, she has this infamous true crime story surrounding her family. And, you know, she needs a break. This $50,000 is going to change her life. So I'm going into this like, fuck yeah. It's gonna be like Squid Games. It's gonna be a competition to the death. Whoever wins, wins the money. 
life changes, good for them. No, 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 uh, that's not how this went. This is a creature feature and there's a creature and similar to Bird Box, it is an invisible creature. The horror aspect of this was lost on me. In Bird Box, at least you have that, there's this very visceral tension in Bird Box which was not as successful in this, unfortunately. The characters all read YA. There were a lot. I feel like you get to know the ones you're supposed to get to know as you go, so I'm okay with that. You switch POVs throughout. That was a little bit confusing. I didn't care enough about some of them to want a POV from them. I wish we had had the entire thing from Max POV. Also, what kind of touches on religion and how wealth is distributed. What kind of person should have money? which kind of person should not have money. This religious kind of interweaving of that principle, which I know doesn't sound like it makes sense, but it does in the book. I don't want to spoil it for you. I wish they had delved into that more. The religion aspect was kind of explained, but not fully. I wish we had gone deeper into that. I wish this had crossed over into like a cult type trope and in which case I think I would have enjoyed it more. It would have been a little darker, it would have been a little heavier, a little more horror. A monster can be a physical thing that can destroy your body, rip your head off, blood and guts and gore and all of that. Or a monster can be a form of oppression, something more sinister and something more sneaky, less obvious, that type of thing. I really like some social commentary in my horror. It was like it tried to go there, but it just didn't quite get there. And so also, also I do want to mention that there is a really abrupt ending. I don't know how I feel about the ending. David from Shelf Possess mentioned that is this a setup for a sequel perhaps. So that got me thinking, is this a setup for a sequel? If it is, and if they took that and delved deeper into some of those things that I wanted to talk more about, you know, I might be open to reading the sequel. I just feel like it's not though. I think it ended in that way in order to make a statement, in order to make a point. I just don't think we went deep enough into that discussion in order for that point to hit as hard as it wanted to. I'll leave it at that. All right, next we're gonna move into my 3.5 star reads this month. I had three of those. First one is a short story that was provided to me by the publisher. This is a sci-fi book. It is called Rosebud by Paul Cornell. I love this blurb on here so much. It says, a scream disguised as a giggle. This book was out there. This is a closed circle sci-fi story or a locked room sci-fi story. I think there's five characters, five sentient digital beings. Okay, so think House on the Cerulean Sea. It says the crew of the Rosebud are currently and by force of law, a balloon, a goth, some sort of science aristocrat possibly, <laughs> a ball of hands, and a swarm of insects. Okay, so you see what I mean? Very strange, kind of hard to keep up with, although gorgeously inclusive, inspiring, just lovely, like a lovely little story about life. It has a lot to say, a lot of parallels about what's going on in our lives right now, in our country, in America, in my country, at least. Yeah, it's very absurdist, but very poignant. The characters of this story are absolutely the stars of the show. They weasel their way into your heart. Like you end up loving them so much and just caring for them so deeply in this like, I think it's like 100 pages. And each of them is so distinct and formidable in their own right. It's in this dystopian future. I will say the writing style was a little weird for me. There was an extreme use of punctuation here. Extreme punctuation. And I like a comma, but I just, I had a hard time deciphering like how each sentence was meant to be read for a little while. But after I got in about 20 pages or so, I kind of got used to it. But yeah, I just think this is a really creative way to tell a very important story. So if you're interested, pick it up. Like I said, it's super fast read. So it very different, very now, very needed. And the next 3.5 star book I read this month is The Children on the Hill by Jennifer McMahon. This was another one that I was really anticipating and kind of disappointed in, but kind of not. Like I, it's what I come to expect from Jennifer McMahon. And I think this is the best of her books that I've read. I've read three of her books now, and I think this one is my favorite of them. A lot of the things about this book really worked for me. A lot of these elements I really enjoyed. The plot was pretty good. The atmosphere was amazing. This book is based on Frankenstein. Frankenstein atmosphere, Frankenstein energy. 
So that was all there, this kind of eerie haunting. And I also loved that there's this like podcast element. There's this kind of cryptid element in there that I really enjoyed. Let me tell you what it's about if you don't know. So we're following these two kids. We do have a dual timeline here. So we flash back to when they're kids and when they're grown. So when they're kids, this brother and sister, they live with their grandma. Their grandma is this renowned psychiatrist, I think. And she's trying to help people with mental health issues. But she's also kind of doing some like experiments on the side. But one day she brings home this little girl and she says, okay, she is gonna live with us now. This is your new sister. Y'all go have fun. These kids have like a monster club. And so they're secretly like hunting for monsters. They have a little diary that we get excerpts from. And they're like, this is how you catch a monster. And this is what's wrong with monsters. A lot of social commentary in here about monsters, about how we treat people who are different from us. So I think that's really crucial, really important. And I loved that in this. I loved that. The first 25% of the story, I was hooked. The last 15% of the story, I was hooked. The middle 60% kind of lost me. Had a little bit of a hard time keeping my interest. I did figure out the twist relatively early on, so that may have contributed to my lack of interest in the middle part of the story. Overall, I just think, like I said about the Darcy Coates, that this vibe is just not for me. I guess this would be a cozy horror as well. Again, I think a lot of people are going to love this book. I think if you like a cozy horror, definitely read this. If you like podcast elements, although I want to say there was not podcast on page. No on page podcast. So just to let you guys know that, we got the behind the scenes of the podcast. It's really about these two sisters and how they see each other, how they see themselves, how they function in the world around them based on this event that happened when they were kids. So yeah, I think it was well done. I do like... Jennifer McMahon's writing, I almost said Darcy Coates. It's just not my thing, you know? For me, it was a 3.5 star. My next 3.5 star book, and I teetered on this one being a four star book, like it's somewhere, and it was a good book. It's very, it's like a high three star, for sure. Queen of the Tiles by Hannah Alcaf. This is a Scrabble book. It's a Scrabble murder mystery. Where are my Scrabble fans? Where, where are they? You, you, uh, read this book. If you like Scrabble, read this book. Read it. I'm not uh, like cocky in general, but I'm kind of cocky about my Scrabble skills. Okay, I'm just gonna put that out there. I love Scrabble. That's me and my mom's thing. We'll play Scrabble. When I was a kid, just killed me. And then one day, I beat her. Ever since that day, it's been neck to Nick. She is my fiercest competitor, you know, and I love it. This book is near and dear to my heart because of that. But holy shit. I've always thought about what it would be like to go to a Scrabble tournament. This just like blew my mind. Okay, let me tell you what this is about. In this book, we're following Najwa. She is clever. She is endearing. She is Oh, so human. Loved her as a character. Absolutely loved her. A year ago, she's at the Scrabble tournament with her very best friend, Trina. Trina is the girl everyone wants to be. The girls want to be her. The guys want to be with her. She's got multicolored rainbow hair. She's like so confident. She is like the it girl. Last year at the Scrabble tournament, she just keels over on top of the Scrabble board, just dies. Najwa is obviously traumatized. We get a lot of insight into her head and like the grief that she's going through after the loss of her best friend. In current day, we're at the Scrabble tournament the next year. Nobody thought Najwa was coming back, but she's coming back to claim this title. She is the queen of the tiles, or she wants to be. Why did Trina die? What happened? And there's these two kids that are making a YouTube series kind of looking into the investigation. And so they start stirring things up. They start asking questions that some people don't want to answer. Najwa, however, doesn't remember a damn thing. From like the week before up to the tournament, something like that. So she's a little bit in the dark. So she decides, you know what? Maybe we should look into this. And we go on from there and we figure out the mystery. This is a YA mystery. The reason I did not give this book five stars, the reason it lost a star, potentially a star and a half, depending on what I where I end with this, is the premise. It doesn't make sense. Trina just keeled over a year ago and- The cops didn't investigate it? Oh, you know, 17 year olds have heart failure all the time. And nobody thinks it's strange that she just keeled over and died? 
till they decide a year later to start looking into it? Like, that is completely implausible. However, <laughs> despite that, I thought this book was really fun. I loved the Scrabble talk more than anything. The mystery could have been awful, but it actually ended up fooling me, but I still would have loved it for the Scrabble. And gosh, I had no idea how hardcore these tournaments could be. It's like counting cards at some point where like they keep track of every tile that is still in the bag and then they get into the math. Like, okay, there's these many tiles and these exact tiles still in the bag. And so the odds of me getting this particular tile is going to affect what I play for this hand based on what I might possibly pick out of the tile bag in the next one, two, three draws based on what they play. It's like, insane. Also, somebody hacks Trina's Instagram. So we're getting messages and posts from a dead girl. And that's kind of what incites all of this curiosity. Somebody is trying to bring attention to the fact that Trina might have been murdered by maybe somebody in this tournament. Now we're getting into the good goods. Now we're getting into my four star reads for the month. And I have four of them. I'm gonna start out with Maybe in Another Life by Taylor Jenkins Reid. I also read this one for my Sliding Doors vlog. And so this has that same trope where you're following two different directions based on one choice in life. In this book, we're following Hannah, who's 29. She's having like a quarter life crisis. She's moved from state to state to state over the years. When she was in high school, her parents and her sister moved to England and she wanted to finish high school in the States in California. And so she stayed behind and lived with her best friend. She's got a lot of trauma from this because she doesn't feel like she has a home. She doesn't feel like she knows her family. She doesn't feel like she has that safe space. She's currently living in New York at the very beginning of the book. I almost said movie. She's moving back to LA where she grew up. She gets to see her best friend again, but there's this guy there who's like the one that got away once again. And she's like, well, maybe I can spark something back up with them, with him. Because, you know, it was never, this, the timing was always off. And so maybe this is our time. So she gets there and the first night they are going out to the bars with all of their high school friends. She sees this guy and she starts to get chatty with him again. And then her friend, her best friend has to leave early. And she's like, hey, um, you know, we all rode together. Are you coming with us? We gotta go. Or, you know, if you wanna stay, with him just let me know and that is where our timeline split in one timeline she stays with him they get back to talking and the second timeline and this is not a spoiler because the whole book is based off of it she walks out from the club in the street and gets hit by a car and ends up in the hospital like fighting for her life in that timeline she gets to know the nurse so we have both of these timelines vastly different based on this one choice that she made. This one definitely did a better job of, of using that trope in order to make it engaging for the reader. There are certain things about our environment, about the people around us that don't change no matter what choices we make. There are things that we know as the reader that are going to affect her life in one timeline based on the information that we get from another timeline. So I thought it was really smart the way that Taylor Jenkins Reid used that. And that was really what I was looking for in that. I did feel like this was a little young for me, even though she's 29. There's a lot of talk about being scared of turning 30 and just feeling old and all of this and as a 35 year old I was slightly offended but I definitely remember going through that and feeling like your life isn't together you're not following this timeline that everybody else is like everyone's getting married and having babies and you're just out here like at the club at the club you know I get that it just felt a little bit young for me but I loved that the message of this one it wasn't about love you do feel like she could be happy with wherever she ends up but it's really about finding herself and finding her home and about her relationship with her best friend and the things that they go through together in this kind of found family. Even if you, you know, don't have living parents, if you don't have a house, you can find home in people. And that was what her best friend was for her and her best friend's family. And so like, I found that to be really touching and I really enjoyed this one. My next four star read for May is Misery by Stephen King. Wow, this was a journey. <laughs> I, I don't know what I was expecting. I've seen the movie. I've seen the movie for this and loved it. Obsessed with Kathy Bates. Obsessed with Annie Wilkes. This hit harder. This hit so hard. I, the body, the body horror. I made like a digital art thing for my Instagram. I'll, I'll pop it up here. That just says the operation is called hobbling. That is the moment of my trauma. 
I am constantly reliving it. And honestly, like this put me in a really weird place. It put me in a, in a place of hopelessness. I felt hopeless. It's one of those situations where like the book was trying to make me feel that way. I cannot hold that against Stephen King because that was the intent and that was the purpose of this book. But I just felt so hopeless and so depressed after reading this that I thought I was going to go in a, in a reading slump. If you don't know, this book is about Paul... I don't want to call him Paul Newman. Fucking just Paul. Okay, so Paul, I don't know his last name. Paul is a famous writer. He writes his newest book. He gets in his car. It's super snowy. I think they're in Colorado, I want to say. He gets in his car. He's had a little bit too much to drink. And he ends up in a terrible accident. But along comes his savior, his help, Annie Wilkes who also happens to be his number one fan, saves his life, rips him out from that car, takes him back to her house, and nurtures him back to health. The end. Nope, that's not the end, because the story is just getting started, because Annie is a fucking psychopath, and Annie... <laughs> Although she's his biggest fan, she gets her hands on his newest release, which is the end of a series called Misery. She does not like what he did with Misery. Paul's gonna pay the damn price. So it's just a struggle the rest of the time. He's helpless, he has broken legs, he can't move. There's nothing he can do. And it goes deep, it goes deep, it goes dark. And oh my gosh, it's so dark. I ended up really liking it. I recommend it. This is basically a modern classic at this point. If you're gonna read a Stephen King, I think this is the one you should read. But if you're sensitive, maybe don't. <laughs> this actually reminds me of how I felt when I read The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires because that one just hit me in the feels so hard that I was mad at it. Like I hated it. I was mad at it. I'm not that mad at this one because I've seen the movie. I knew what to expect going in. I just didn't know it was going to go that dark. Yeah, the body horror is really intense. So definitely some trigger warnings in here. But um, Annie Wilkes as a character is just genius. Like I understand why this book is so loved. It's iconic. It's canon. It's misery. Four stars. Really liked it. My next four star book is The Paradox Hotel by Rob Hart. I ended up really liking this one. I'm going to preface this by saying that this book probably isn't for everyone. This is very niche and I feel like it's specifically for someone like me. I like sci-fi from time to time. I like horror. I like a murder mystery. It's like all of these different genres put together. Thriller as well. We're following January and she is the head of security for the Paradox Hotel. At the Paradox Hotel, if you are rich enough, if you have enough money, you can travel back in time to whenever you want. You can go to fucking Egypt. You can go back to Shakespearean times to see Hamlet perform. You can go back to Regency England and pretend you are Elizabeth Bennet. You can do like all of the things, whatever you want if you have enough money. January is in charge of security for the hotel, like I said, and she's part of this almost like FBI agency. They monitor time travel. So it's not, does not have FBI like detective vibes. It has more of average person investigating something. So it's not, if you don't like detective things, that's, I don't think that's gonna scare you away from this one. January herself, I just loved her as a character. She is grieving the loss of a loved one. She refuses to be vulnerable, refuses to show any bit of vulnerability. She has this hard, toasted, crusty outside, but on the inside, she's soft. Like she, there is love in there in her heart. She's just broken, but she's also hilarious. She is sassy. Like she's a complete asshole to like everyone around her, including her personal assistant, who is a drone named Ruby. January programmed her to have the voice of an Australian man because having a female voice for a secretary is sexist. So that they're carrying up for this big meeting where they are going to discuss possibly privatizing time travel because the government's not making enough money off of this and it's just not worth it to them anymore. So they're going to basically offer time travel up to the highest bidder. I can't remember what it's called, but there's like this disease that happens when you time travel too much. Because January, because this is her field, this is her profession, she's time traveled a lot. She's experiencing time out of order. And so she'll have things pop up in her vision. She doesn't know what's real, what's not real. So we've got a little bit of an unreliable narrator. She needs to retire, but she won't because there's something that's keeping her there that's connected to her grief. When January sees a dead body in one of the hotel rooms that no one else can see. She's determined to find out who that is, when that is, and what the hell is happening. There is a lot going on. I read this one also for my Try Chapter video. And so I ended up reading the first chapter twice, which I really think helped me understand what was going on. It solidified the world building 
for me. And so I didn't have as much of a hard time understanding what was going on with the time travel and like everything where I think a lot of other people based on the reviews that I've seen found it kind of confusing. So I would definitely recommend making sure you have a firm grasp on that first chapter before moving on because there's a lot of information that's coming in. But what this book is really about is getting back to that place of vulnerability, getting back to that place of finding joy in life after grief. There's a found family aspect in here that I love. It got very full of heart at the end, very emotional. That's what really got me. As far as my critiques of this go, the characters that we that we focus on, the main characters, the MCs, they are extremely diverse. We get a lot of inclusive discussion within this, but it's slightly misguided in that some of the side characters are stereotyped, unfortunately. You know, there's, there's a slight problematic issue there with some of that, but I think it, it came from good intent, though that doesn't necessarily matter. I could definitely see that this was written by a man. I hate to say that. It's not a perfect book, but it's really smart. The way that it's done, the way that it's written is very clever. Like I said, the found family, the like coming together of this group of people really is what hit me in the heart and what solidified this as four stars for me. And let's not forget, my last four star book is Notes on an Execution by Danya Kukavka. I had such a hard time with this book, but I loved it. I'm so torn about this book. I ended up settling on four stars for this because I love what it was saying. I love what it was doing. The writing style just didn't completely work for me. And there were certain things that I didn't know going in that if, I think if I had known would have changed my entire experience with this book. So I'm going to tell you so that if you decide to read it, you will go in with the right headspace. It's not spoilers. I'm not going to give you any spoilers. And there's not really any spoilers to give on this one, I guess. <laughs> like, that's the other thing. This is literary suspense. This is not going to be a fast-paced twisty thriller or twisty horror, if that's what you're looking for. This book has something to say. It does a very effective job at that, but it's not going to be the one that's going to give you all the twists. So if you're looking for that, you may not want this one. There are a couple little ones. Definitely literary suspense is apt as the genre. What is this book about? It's a discussion about the true crime genre, I think. I think that's what I would say is like the main discussion here. How we view killers, how we glamorize killers, and how we tend to forget the victims. We have alternating chapters here. We're following Ansel, who is this guy. He's on death row. For each of his chapters, we're counting down from 12 hours, 11 hours, 10 hours, until the point of his execution. These chapters are told in second person but not your typical second person. He's not writing a letter. He's not talking to anyone specific. He is talking to himself about himself, almost as if it's this like omniscient character looking at him who knows his thoughts and feelings. It's kind of strange. It threw me off, not gonna lie. Typically I do enjoy second person POV, but what I didn't understand which I later found out after listening to a podcast with the author, is that her purpose of this, and this is what I want to make sure you are clear on, the purpose of doing it like this was for you, the reader, to feel like you are in his place, to feel like you are in the position of the killer and to get inside his head. He thinks he's smart. He thinks he's really clever. He thinks he's going to pull one over and he doesn't, he doesn't think he's going to die. He also has these theories. He has a, a manifesto as they typically do. I happen to agree with his manifesto, which is about the multiverse. You know, I love a multiverse and it's about the nature of good and evil and how it, it lives on a spectrum. There is no pure evil. There is no pure good, but we are all somewhere in between and navigate back and forth on that spectrum throughout our lives. But his idea is that in another universe, he didn't commit this crime. So is he really responsible? So his idea is like kind of shallow, like he's just trying to get away with the things that he did. Alternating chapters, we, we get to follow the lives of the women that he has affected, including his mother, a detective, the sister of his once partner. We are highlighting the women in his life at the same time as we are kind of lifting up the curtain underneath the mind of this killer. So that's the gist of this. That's the point of this. I loved what this book was trying to say. I loved a lot of things about this. I will link the podcast that I listen to. It's actually like on, it's on YouTube, but it's podcast in the interview with the author and she describes a, a lot. I would actually watch slash listen to that before you read the book to, because there's no spoilers in that, but just to kind of give you an idea of what you're getting into and see if you're interested in that or not. 
I ended up giving this a four star because I didn't like the writing style. A lot of it felt really dry to me. And I was confused for most of it. But after I listened to that podcast and after I thought about it, I really, really loved what it was doing. So kind of settled in between the three and a five. So we are at a four star on that one. Next, we have one 4.5 star book and one five star book, two books to go. We're almost there. Hang in with me. These are the best of the bunch. My 4.5 star book for the month of May is Adrian McKinty's The Island. I think Ashley from Ashley's Little Library is solely responsible for the popularity of this book. So the author should be giving her some kind of compensation. It was really good. If you want a thriller similar to No Exit, that's very fast paced, very atmospheric, to the point, but also we get some depth from these characters, a little bit of heart in there as well. This is a really good one. It's going to keep you invested. It's going to keep your attention. It's going to go by fast. The Island is about this family of Americans and they are on vacation in Australia. The dad's there for a conference. So the family comes along to kind of make a vacation out of it. We have two kids, I think 12 year old boy and 14 year old girl and their stepmom. They are newly married the stepmom and the dad and something tragic happened to his wife before her which we find out along the way that's affecting the kids um, but they end up getting into this situation where they go on this private island to find a koala the kids want to see koalas and these random guys say look we live on this private island there's tons of koalas give me some money you can spend a little bit of time there, but don't stay there longer than 45, 30, 45 minutes. You got to get in and out because my family lives there and they don't like company. There are no rules on this island. So they get there and something happens, an incident happens, and they piss off this family. And so now the rest of the book, they are just trying to survive. They're just trying to get home, trying to get off this island. So we have the isolation trope that I absolutely love. And then also we have a little bit of commentary about the Aboriginal people who lived on this island. Although I don't know, I still don't really know how I feel about how that was done because while they mention it and they say this was wrong, that the people who, the native people who lived here were killed and lost their home, it's really kind of a side story and they really don't say anything other than that. Although I am not a part of that community, so really don't listen to my opinion about it. Take that for what it is. But yeah, this one's really fast paced and it's a lot of fun. It'll have you tense. It'll give you hot vibes on this island surrounded by salt water. You can't drink the water. You gotta survive in this Australian heat. It is intense. It makes you sweat just reading it. Very, very good. Definitely recommend. All right, my last and final book. My only five star book of this month. It's probably going to be a surprise to you because it was a surprise to me. And that is The Book of Two Ways by Jodi Picoult. This was my first Jodi Picoult. I have heard that a lot of her other books are very controversial. Some people very much hate them. This one I didn't, I loved everything about it. It was so cerebral, but also like heavy hearted. It made me feel, it made me cry, it made me laugh. It taught me things. This book is so smartly written. I am just so impressed by her writing. What What is this about? I also read this for my vlog, my Sliding Doors vlog. So we have that trope there. We're going both ways. So in this book, we're following Dawn. Dawn in her current life is married to Brian. She has a daughter. Her daughter has a lot of issues about her body that frankly I identified with too much. And in this current day, she is a death doula. What is a death doula, you ask? A death doula is the same as like a birth doula, but the opposite. It's someone who guides someone through death for people that know they're going to die. She helps them and their family from financial stuff to emotional stuff to like everything in between. She gets on a plane and as she's on the plane, the flight attendant announces, y'all buckle up, we might be going down. And as she's thinking that she's gonna die, she's not thinking about her husband, she's thinking about Wyatt, who she met in college. Wyatt is some kind of like a duke or earl or something. So in her past life with Wyatt, they had this kind of like hate to love thing. They were competing in this grad program. They were studying Egyptology and this is her like passion in life. So she decides she wants to go see Wyatt and he's in Egypt like digging up a tomb. And so in one life she goes back to see Wyatt and in her current life she goes home to her husband. And then we go forward from there. There is so much discussion about love, about life, about death, about the weight of choices and fate and it's so nuanced and so magical. And there's also, so her current husband, Brian, is a scientist and he works 
in quantum mechanics. So we also get this really in-depth discussion about quantum mechanics and the idea of the multiverse and all of that, which I loved. There is a twist in here that smacked me in the face. Smacked me in the face. In retrospect, I was like, I should have seen that coming, but I didn't. I didn't see it coming at all. And it just hit me so hard. I think I was a little distracted by the Egyptology and the quantum mechanics and all of that. So I was just like, I did not see it. But when it hit me, I was like, yes, yes. Like, don't, I've seen other reviews that people say that like other Jodi Picoult books have triggered me. This is not like the rest of her books. I've seen reviews like that. So I have nothing to base this on because I've never read any of her other books. But if you have read her before and you didn't like it because of something triggering or something weird that she did, I don't even know what that might be. Try this one anyway because it's so good. There is an ambiguous ending. If you don't like an ambiguous ending, you might not like this, but it serves a point, it serves a purpose, and it still makes you think. It answers questions, but it also makes you think. It's everything in between. It's glorious. It's wonderful. This is probably going to be on my favorites of the year list. Like, I've, there's so much to say about it. Like, I could talk about it forever. Go check out my vlog if you're interested in more in-depth conversation about this, because I go into it pretty deep over there. And that's it. Those are the 14 books that I've read this month. Oh my gosh, you guys. Whew. I've read a lot of books that I wanted to read. So a lot of books getting checked off the list. A lot of information for you guys, whether or not you want to read those. I do have coming up. I know you guys submitted questions to me for my Q&A, for my 4K Q&A. It's coming. I promise you it is coming. I had some technical difficulties, but I'm getting back. That'll be your next video. I also have my third quarter anticipated thriller and horror books coming out as well. So stay tuned for that. If you like the kind of books that I like. If you, you know, are not completely annoyed by me, maybe subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. That would be amazing. Check me out on Instagram, you guys. A lot of the times I'm in my stories and I'm pretty active on Instagram. A lot of times I will give you some information on books that I'm reading ahead of time before you get them here. So if you're interested in that, go ahead and check me out over there. As always, if you have any book recs for me that you think I might like, especially if they involve either the multiverse or like horror, or thriller, something twisty, something fast, something that's character driven, please let, give them to me. Give me the Rex. You guys are the best. I love you. I appreciate you. Don't ever change. I will see you next time with another video. Don't forget that life is short. So read Riley. Cheers and goodbye.